Well, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Thank you for connecting for this January 2021 Enfolds uh, webinar. Enfold is the network for life detection. It's one of the of several uh, research coordination networks that na the NASA Astrobiology Program puts together. Uh, this seminar occurs every other month, um, but if you're interested in speaking and sharing your research, or if you're a student and you want to share what you us, share with us what you're doing please reach out to us at contact.enfold at gmail.com and we would love to schedule you for these webinars. Today, however, we're delighted to have Dr. Chris German who joins us from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He is a senior scientist and as you'll see today, very much interested at the intersection of ocean worlds as well as terrestrial events. And uh, he'll be uh, presenting us as a survey of the events on earth to help us think about events in uh, beyond earth. So Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, speak with us today. And we're excited to uh, hear what you have to say. Thank you, Sanjoy. Um, <clears throat> so before I start, I should apologize to everybody that uh, Sanjoy contacted me at the start of the year and said, we have this slot coming up and it'd be great if you could come and give a presentation that you gave to, um, we have, we're part of a project on within the network for ocean worlds. It's called Exploring Ocean Worlds. It's trying to think about where would you go on the, or how, how would you use what we understand about oceans on our own planet to, to guide where we would explore other ocean worlds in the future? And said, well, yeah, that's easy because you know, it's a presentation I already gave and we don't have to make any new slides and it would just be the same talk would be great. And it was only uh, in the last couple of weeks as we went back and dug out the, the original presentation, the recording realized that it was a presentation given without any slides whatsoever. Um, which isn't the most photogenic, especially if you only have a seminar once every two months, then. Uh, so there is good reason why I'm going to come back to that, but I have put together a few slides just to introduce the topic. Um, so I'm somebody who spends a lot of time, or I've spent my career, interested in deep sea hydrothermal flow and trying to understand where water and rocks interact together in Earth's oceans and what results from that. I come at it very much from a geochemistry perspective, but oceanography doesn't really allow you to have a single discipline because you know, the oceans don't really respect that kind of variability. So, so most of my research career has been in doing detection in the ocean. It's been carrying out exploration, trying to look for where fluid flow is. But as I carried on exploring, what I've actually found is that there's, we continue to get surprised about, well, what is actually out there in the first place and how do you even know what you should be looking for? So that's, that's where I'm going to start. So let me share my screen and I will show you some pretty slides. Um, but then I'll explain to you why that's not what you should be impressed by. So can you now see my PowerPoint slide? Yep. And as I go on the full screen. Yep. Uh, it, well, we so, see the presenter, the presenter view, though. Uh, can oh, you've you got the presenter view? Let me hang on. Let me see if I can change monitors around. Let me try sharing again. Did that make things any better? Mm, we're still, we're still exactly the same. Yeah, there's a swap, there's there's a swap, swap displays it. button. Oh yeah. How's that? That's great. Beautiful. Did it? Okay. I should stop using two screens. The other one was just unplug my monitor. So, for those of you who aren't, you know, there's no reason why you're in Center for Life Detection, you should have any knowledge of the ocean anyway. So let's start on land and something you're familiar with, you should all be familiar with. So, Yellowstone has hot springs, like Old Faithful, which are really spectacular. So this is really a good starting point, is 
okay, so, so one of these things is really easy to tell is there from a distance. And the other one may be a lot more interesting if you're looking for life. Okay, grand prismatic springs on the right, all those different colors are all because of different kinds of extremophiles living in the hot water, whereas it's the, the Old Faithful is the thing that you could actually see on the horizon if you were hiking through Yellowstone and go, oh, I wonder what that is in the sky. And you might walk towards it, but that may not actually be the thing you actually care about. And that same kind of thing kind of works underwater as well. Um, so if you think about underwater hydrothermal activity, if you're anybody who's like rooted in the 1970s, you would think about a black smoker like this. And um, it's not that long ago, it was only about five years ago, I went to a talk in Pasadena where people had, a, there was an entire session on ocean worlds and life in space. And seven of the eight speakers that morning all had pictures of a black smoker that weren't even as pretty as this. They had exactly the same picture from National Geographic. And then Carolyn Porco was kind of enlightened because she actually had a picture of Lost City. And so she knew about the new big thing um, but the trouble is, the most recent thing you've discovered isn't necessarily the end of the journey. That's kind of what I want to get across here is that's why I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about photographs is that the events continue to surprise us and they continue to come in lots of different um, forms and functions. Um, this was briefly something that was got a lot of attraction because it was something that actually was a new discovery about the same time that the first evidence for hydrothermal activity on Celadus came to light and they were quite similar or they had um, attributes that were quite interesting. Um, this is a vent site that um, I've studied most recently from about a year ago, which is a clear fluid and not a black smoker. And, um, you know, and here's another kind of seafloor hydrothermal vent. And so they can come in lots of different site shapes and sizes. It's just because water and rock are interacting, you can't really project ahead of time what all the different things are gonna be or, or you, can't de novo say, if I'm gonna go down to the seafloor in any one location, this is what I'm gonna find because a lot of these things were not predicted ahead of time. They feel, fell outside the spectrum of past human experience. And so that wasn't what people were expecting to find. The other reason I don't wanna spend a lot of time sending you photographs is you can actually have completely different vent sites that look just like each other, like these ones, okay? Now these four, if you looked at them, the previous slide, you could sit there and go like, oh, well, they're obviously different from each other. So they are gonna be clearly different. But I can tell you that one of these things is a conventional black smoker of the kind that was first found. And another one is really rich in hydrogen and methane because it's got ultramafic influence. I can tell you another one is actually just longer lived than the other. And it's working in different kinds of um, gabroic rocks instead of basalts. And another one has hydrogen just because it's under high pressure. And I don't think you could actually tell me and like, unless you're kind of like a nerd like me who knows them all on first name terms because you've been out and hung out with them, then you wouldn't be able to tell at a glance which one it was you just found. So that's kind of what's perplexing. Um, and the way you actually do get beyond that is you go actually take a sample of these things and then you analyze their chemistry and then you find out, oh, that's really interesting. So then this must mean that such and such a water rock reaction is taking place. So you can do, you can do post-event diagnostics but I have on more than one occasion come home from sea with samples of something where I thought I knew what it was I'd sampled and then 2020 hindsight afterwards showed us actually that was more interesting than you realized that wasn't just more of the same stuff you've seen before that's something completely new that's pushing the boundaries of what we previously knew as the limits of how water and rock could react together and, and generate chemical outputs. So there are lots of different kinds of vehicles you can use to do that kind of stuff. So this is my bragging chart of different kinds of toys I've played with over 30 years that have continued to confound my ability to predict what I'm gonna see next. So I've just given up now. After 30 years, I just realized I'm never gonna actually get to the point where I actually know what I'm gonna find. I just have to like embrace the fact that the, this planet will continue to, to expand my vocabulary. Um, and so that's really, I think, a good launch point for where we go next is just trying to like communicate that to you guys today so that as we think about where else we might go and look for life in space is just trying to think about um, all the different ways that, that that can come about. And the rather than it just be despair that it's just a whole bunch of stamp collecting and you're never gonna find the same thing twice. So it's all horrendous. The part that is like the grand unifying theory is that from a, from a hydrothermal perspective, the reason we persevere with it is that what all these different diversity of things have in common is that Basically, if you have a combination of rocks and water and flow, 
then you are going to basically continually sustain some level of chemical disequilibrium, which is going to provide energy even in the absence of photons for photosynthesis, which then is going to provide a habitable environment which may or may not also host life as well. So this is very much a, uh, you know, what are all the different kinds of things you can find rather than um, how would you actually go and search for them, which becomes a second thing. And you know, maybe some point in the future, you're always welcome to invite me back to if that was the lecture you were hoping for. Um, but where I'm gonna end here is, is with this picture here, and um, I'd encourage you to grab a screenshot of the website here. This is basically, this is all of human knowledge as it stands today, which continues to progress of where we know about hydrothermal vents of different kinds around the planet. Um, so the circles are where discoveries have been made. And then there's lots and lots of blue space, which is oceans, places where people haven't looked. So there's still plenty more to be, to be found. And that's what I would contest is it would be arrogant of us to presume that all we're gonna do is find more of the same kinds of things we've already found, because that's still not working out that way for me, um, uh, that I continue to be surprised about things. But the, the website, there's a, an international program called Interreach that continues to update all the sites that are known. So as new discoveries get made, there's like a one-stop shop where you can go find all that stuff and learn more about it. So I'm gonna stop sharing slides there as the generic introduction. And instead I'm gonna do a weird thing, but this is what I did. Um, basically it was something that I did for the early career um, members of our uh, Ocean Worlds community. And it was just basically a, a tour through this spreadsheet, which I think I've made available to Sanjoy. So he'll be able to share it um, with the rest of you online if he hasn't done already. So you can follow along at home if you want to. But basically it's, it's um, let me see how big I should make it so I can just go through a few learns at a time. All this is really done and all I'm gonna do is, is talk through kind of like a, a historical perspective of where discoveries got made that I think were important. And in there, there's in the far column, there's some like type locality papers of things that I think would be worth going and reading. If, if any of this stuff gets, it, gets you interested, then this is where you can go and learn more. So the starting point was, in fact, there's a, there's a row zero that's missing here. The first vents that were found of any kind were in 1977 on the Galapagos Rift. And they were only about 12 degrees Celsius. There was some warm water coming out the ground um, along, a, along a volcanic ridge. There were all kinds of weird and wonderful animals there, the tube worms and the uh, giant shrimp that are like some of the charismatic megafauna from the original vent discoveries. And there was a guy at MIT, John Edmund, who then took those fluids and he noticed that they were slightly depleted in um, uh, magnesium compared to seawater. And he did an outrageous thing. He kind of came up with an outrageous thought experiment and projected backwards to, well, if in the extreme, all the magnesium had been stripped out of this water at depth, and then this is just remixed with seawater, what temperature would those fluids have been? And so he published a paper that was completely outrageous at its time saying, okay, I've measured these fluids and they're 12 degrees Celsius compared to uh, something that's only about two degrees Celsius at the seafloor. And I project that there will be fluids about 350 degrees Celsius somewhere in hydrothermal vents. And I was an undergraduate at the time, I was like senior year undergraduate when I read that, I was like, that's amazing what people can do and how you can extrapolate of like, you know, how did that not get into nature? And it was such an outrageous claim. It was like that kind of thing. But, um, and then two years later, people went and actually found a vent site that fit exactly, it was actually 360 degrees Celsius, but his 350 degree extrapolation was, uh, made me think, well, there's a smart guy. So I ended up, as soon as I graduated from uh, in the UK, that was, I made it my business to go and do a postdoc with him um, and learn more about hydrothermal stuff. So that was where my history started. So the first vent sites were found at 350 degrees C in, in basalts on the fast spreading East Pacific rise. And if you'd asked me back then, in fact, I did um, back in like 1990 or so was the first time I started doing any work where I actually got interviewed by media and had any chance to talk to anybody about hydrothermal activity. And I, as a direct quote was at the time was anybody who tells you that seafloor hydrothermal activity has anything to do with the origins of life is a charlatan. I mean, that was like, I fervently believed it at the time. It had nothing to do with the origins of life. 
because basalt hosted systems are so oxidizing and so corrosive that organic material should be destroyed as they pass through those systems. So um, until anybody found something different, then that was stuff that just couldn't actually be important. And that kind of persisted into the 1990s with um, where I kind of entered the fray as, a, as part of my own research career was the, the first discoveries of similar kinds of black smokers that were found on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And they were basically, they were large event sites. They made bigger mineral deposits. They clearly had lived for longer. But when it actually came to measuring the vent fluid chemistry of what was happening, they were really disappointingly similar to the ones on these specific rocks. You know, and, and it's basically because you know, if we if we ride roughshod all of, over all of ocean chemistry and petrology, then we can say you know seawater everywhere on our planet is basically a three and a half percent salt solution, and it's interacting with something with a basaltic composition, whether it's either basalts or gabbros. You know, the only difference really is the grain size, and so sure enough, if those are your two major reactants and you mix them together under the same conditions of you know the kind of temperatures that basalts erupt at, then sure enough, you're going to get the same end product out. So. Um, I know John Edmund was like very discouraged of, well, then there's no point actually going and looking at anywhere else. I looked at these two data points and they're exactly the same as each other. So all other events are gonna be the same and there's nothing more to be done with hydrothermal research. It's not interesting. Um, and so they moved on. Um, about the same time as the tag site, just down the road from there on the Middle Atlantic Ridge was the snake pit site, which is found. And, and the difference there is that the tag site was somewhere that was under was basically sitting on top of some really major intersecting faults. And so that's why the vent site could live for longer. And that's why you could have a longer time series and you could build up larger mineral deposits. But it was basically the same thing. When you went to the snake pit site, it was something sitting on top of a little volcanic ridge at the scale of an outcrop of what you could see out of a submersible window. It looked just like a new specific rise site. So it was even less interesting in terms of like trying to go and explore and look for more different kinds of vent sites. Um, from that, at about the time of the Ridge 2000 program in the US, uh, a lot of interest sprung up on some new black smokers that have been found about nine degrees north on the East Pacific Rise. And a lot of people got into doing interesting process studies of how these systems function. Um, and what became interesting there, that was one of the first indications that because they knew where a whole bunch of black smoke events were that they'd, uh, they prospected for, um, looking for their plumes, the submersible sort of drove up and down the same section of ridge and it stumbled upon some other things. And so this is the first evidence of not every hydrothermal vent has to be a black smoker. So they had chimneys that actually had clear fluids coming out of the ground, but they were actually generating iron rich smoky plumes up in the water column as that iron oxidized and precipitated. But they were things that actually didn't have a lot of hydrogen sulfide. They were slightly lower temperatures. And so we actually found that there were different composition of fluids coming out of the ground, even though they were generating the kind of hydrothermal plumes that we used to know where to actually go look on the seafloor. And then in studying those sites um, with the Ridge 2000 program, the other thing that came about was that by doing time series studies, people happened to be in the right place at the right time when volcanic eruptions happened and completely perturbed these systems. And so that's something else that we found is it, it provided a new perspective that hydrothermal exploration and understanding how venting could occur wasn't just a function of geographic distribution, but it was also a, a fourth dimension as well of the same place. If you go back to the same place, it can evolve through time. Um, and so what was actually found was that um, right after an eruption, there was a huge sort of outgassing of volatiles first. And then there seemed to be like a brine phase that was left behind that would then be, get purged and then everything would relax back to the conventional black smokers people had seen before. Um, and the argument was that if you know what from GPS surveys and things like that and magnetic stripes, you have an idea of how fast plate tectonics works and how fast the ridge is spreading on average. The other thing you could take is that the, the quantum amount that a ridge spreads at a time is through an injection of a basaltic dike in a very simplistic model and they're about a meter wide. So if you have a ridge or two plates that are separating at five centimeters a year, you might expect one eruption every 20 years or so. And if it's going 10 centimeters a year, you might want expect one every decade. And if it's going 20 centimeters a year, you might expect one every five years. So these are the kinds of time scales that are testable hypotheses. You know, you could go and set up and actually say, okay, well then I would expect that there should be a fresh volcanic eruption here. And the current, you know, one of the working hypotheses of our model for how that works is that when you first um, 
have an extrusive event, it basically purges the the reservoir for the deep biosphere. So there's like a whole bunch of porosity in volcanic rocks, which is probably warm and makes a really nice incubation spot for, for microbes. And all that will probably get blown out first. But then if you have this injection of magma at depth, then you have the opportunity for phase separation as well. So you basically get the equivalent of like a high pressure equivalent of boiling of the seawater. So then that can drive out vapor phases but it leaves behind, it kind of flashes and leaves behind a brine, but then that stuff could also get purged before the whole thing settles back. So you can see these um, time series of like, there are model curves that fit to sporadic data um, to show how things like the salinity of the fluids come changes and how the volatile contents and the metal contents and things like that evolve through time. So those are kind of interesting things. And so the Wonder Fuca and the East Pacific Rise gave evidence for those things in terms of a time series. And then very soon after that, there were some studies, one on the Southern East Pacific Rise and one on the Southern Middle Atlantic Ridge, which were only single, you know, they're more remote locations that people went to, but they seem to arrive just at the immediate end of um, one of these eruptions or in the immediate aftermath. And so it seemed to be, there were places where you could see lots and lots of fresh lava on the seafloor, and you could capture these things where we said, we saw fluids that actually went up to over 400 degrees Celsius. So, that's kind of like the record, I think it's about 402 degrees Celsius. So again, it just continuing to explore also pushed us to a limit of, you know, what are, the, what are the highest temperatures you can find as well as highest pressures you can find in different places. That then brings us to um, still in basaltic hosted systems. The most recent stuff is work that I've worked on from the Cayman Rise and the Picard hydrothermal field, which is about 5,000 meters depth. And there, when you go to such high pressures, then you can actually sustain higher temperatures, even in the absence of phase separation. So that's where we've got um, fluids now that it's not just because something just erupted, it's just continuously stable at temperatures are around just above 400 degrees Celsius. And interestingly there, when you take just basalt and seawater and you keep moving it to different pressures and temperatures, you can continue to, to push the chemistry and actually end up with different chemical reactions as a result. And so the Picard site is really exciting because it's a basalt hosted system, which is now sufficiently chemically reducing that you can get high concentrations of free hydrogen. So that's one of the ways you can then like negate my, my 30 year old assertion or my 30 year younger naivety of there's nothing to be seen here at hydrothermal vents has anything to do with origins of life and life detection and stuff like that. Um, but the other thing that's really been interesting from my career has been understanding the geologic diversity of hydrothermal vents as well, of how much, even if you can't change the composition of seawater massively, then you can actually change the lithology that the water is interacting with. So the first examples of that were from the rainbow hydrothermal field on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is kind of like a hybrid system. It's not entirely ultramafic hosted, but it has some combination of the, sea, the rocks it's seeing at depth are a combination of basalts and gabbros and ultramafic rocks. So you can see the influence of both. You have a thing that comes out of the ground looking like a black smoker and you wouldn't know it was different, but when you measure things like its methane concentrations and its hydrogen concentrations and its organic composition, it's really demonstrably different from all the other black smokers that you find. You, know, you can find near neighbors that are in basalts on the middle Atlantic region, they're quite different. And we're actually at the point now where along the Atlantic, there's probably 15 to 20 vent sites that have been found in the Northern Atlantic Ridge. And it's about a 50-50 mix, about half of all those vent sites are actually in tectonically hosted systems and actually have this, um, this high hydrogen, high methane characteristic, um, which until, until further notice, we haven't found in the Pacific, but that's where we'll end up later on. Um, and then continuing down, then the next big discovery was the Lost City hydrothermal field. A lot of you might be familiar with that one. It's a, an alkaline hydrothermal field. It seems to be fueled entirely by serpentinization or largely by serpentinization without necessarily any requirement for magmatic heating. Um, they're found in the transforms between sections of ridge. So it's in a, a more a fault controlled system. And it seems to be that there's enough exothermic energy from the serpentinization reaction when you basically have water reacting with um, ultramafic rocks that that may be actually be out of fuel itself as a, as a different way of getting a different kind of fluid flow that can still host. Um, it has really interesting mineralogies. It's more sort of carbonates and um, rather than sulfides. 
uh, it has its own distinctive microbiology. It has a lot of, again, hydrogen and methane. There's evidence for abiotic organic synthesis in these systems. And if you look at a, a bathymetry map of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, there should be, you would guess, there should be one of these about every 50 miles along several thousand kilometers of Mid-Ocean Ridge. And it's kind of perplexing that since the first one was found around the turn of the century in the early 2000s, we're another 20 years in and there haven't been any others found in the Atlantic. Although there was one just recently discovered about three years ago in the Southwest Indian Ridge. And it was discovered exactly the same way the first one was. A bunch of geologists were diving to go look at fault rocks and petrology on the seafloor and this vent site got in their way. They had no idea it was gonna be there. They had made no prediction to look for it. Um, and it was just something that was getting in the way of the outcrop that they didn't expect. But with 2020 hindsight, when you look at where they occur, the same geologic settings recur, you know, every some, you know, less than hundred kilometers along axis, you get the same kind of fracture you know, offsets between sections of ridge. There's no reason why they shouldn't be there. It's just a matter of trying to come up with, well, how would you actually go and look for such elusive things on the seafloor? So that's remaining a challenge. And then, you know, the reason that I felt confounded of how are we ever going to come up with this, you know, how can you actually plan an exploration, you know, a search strategy if you haven't finished learning everything there is, came from the work from the Caribbean from the Mid Cayman Rise. That was the thing about a dozen years ago was I actually like got funding to actually go and carry out the first systematic exploration for a lost city type hydrothermal field following exactly what I knew from Lost City and, and what it should look like in the water column and how we'd actually go and do that. And instead, what we actually discovered was the Von Dam hydrothermal field, which falls outside of everything we'd found before. It was something completely new and different. So I didn't have a search strategy that I could actually put to NSF of this is what I'm going to look for, because how do you write a, a peer reviewed proposal that says I'm going to go look for something that doesn't exist yet? Um, and where it becomes really exciting, I and mean, this has been feeding back, you know, from a NASA perspective, this is kind of stuff that's feeding back into the decadal survey that's underway right now, as people ask questions of what have been the big new discoveries in the last decade that inform, you know, that, that uh, you know, are, are of note. The new discoveries aren't only in space and space missions, that these new vent sites we found actually have a lot of the characteristics that are required. They're about 100 degrees Celsius, so they're not a conventional black smoker temperature. They're rich in silica. Um, they're rich in hydrogen and methane and have CO2 as well, um, which for those of you who know the Enceladus literature, that in a word picture is exactly everything that's inferred for the hydrothermal sites at the bottom of the seafloor and Enceladus. Um, so it's kind of a cool thing that that these vent sites weren't known when Carolyn Porco first started imaging the vents on Enceladus or the, the jets coming out of the South Pole. That if people had actually analyzed those fluids straight away and said, well, I want, you know, this looks like a hydrothermal active vent of this kind, people would have said, but there's no such thing on our planet. So how could there be one on the Enceladus? So it's kind of a, a the parallel evolution of, of we're still actually making discoveries on our own planet that um, that help inform what else is going on or might be going on elsewhere. And just to end that, the most recent work I've been doing, which is still like frustrating because the ice keeps getting in the way, is the work, the reason we were doing the work in the Caribbean was basically because it was the same geologic setting as we expect on the Gackle Ridge in the Arctic. It's one of the least promising volcanically um, to go and explore. And so since about 2014, I've had three trips with an icebreaker so far. Um, well, we've actually been able to track down and even photograph the first vent sites on the seafloor. We've been able to take samples from the water directly above it. And again, this is somewhere where, you know, we had the photographs and we had the samples in the bank and we headed back, um, back, to, back to shore thinking, okay, well, we found a basalt hosted hydrothermal field and it's just another black smoker. It's about as exciting as John Edmund was when he found the tag Middle Atlantic Ridge back in the uh, tag side of the Middle Atlantic Ridge in the 1980s. Except that when we did the chemistry and did the workup, we actually found that this is a hydrogen rich, high methane to manganese ratio plume sitting over something which is demonstrably sitting on pillow basalts at the seafloor. So, in fact, the plumbing subsurface of these new vent sites in the Arctic must be different from anything we've seen previously. So, it's basically we're continuing to expand our vocabulary of the geologic setting and how it manifests itself up in the overlying water column. Um, and then the last one here is just the most recent cruise I was on before COVID locked us all down. 
In fact, all of these, these, these last three were all from 2019. They were like the second half of 2019. So we have two sites in the Arctic that are outside what we're familiar with. And then we have a site from the Gorda Ridge, which is kind of weird in terms of being close to home, but that's inside the US exclusive economic zone. It's less than 200 miles offshore from the California Oregon border. And there's a vent site there that's sitting not on a ridge. It's only about 300 degrees. It's not easy to know it's there because it's just got clear fluids coming out of it, not black smokers. It's not a readily detectable thing, but it's been stable for decades. So again, it was something that was stumbled upon by the, with the US Navy submersible sea cliff. Um, and so it's, that's one of the newest sites we've been working on and uh, Everett Shock and his group have been working with us to actually look at the, these fluids and try and work out what, that, what the implications are for what's happening in the subsurface. So that's a tour of mid-ocean ridges. And then just to wrap up, then there's this, like where I spend a lot of my time obsessing these days is, well, what else are we missing? What are all the other things that could be out there? And so that's what our Exploring Ocean Worlds um, program is, is pursuing. It's uh, one of these five-year astrobiology programs. It sort of kind of falls in the gap between the end of NAI that was before it and it predates the ICAR program that exists now for these five-year large, large team projects. But what our project is trying to do is trying to use a combination of, of take, take the intelligence we have from field studies and recycle for that back into predictive modeling and a little bit of experimentation where we think we come up with something um, what looks exciting to try and anticipate where the most interesting kinds of water rock interactions might be in the universe including here on earth that we haven't found yet um, so they can actually help us understand well where else or you know what might be the kind of planet and what might be the conditions on some other ocean world that would be really good to host life that we could go and search for but also where might that manifest itself here on earth if it isn't something we've already found and how would we actually plan to actually go and explore for it so the kinds of things we're interested in like an aside is there's for completeness i should talk about sediment hosted hydrothermal vents um, exactly what kind of sedimentation there might be on ocean worlds elsewhere in the universe, I don't know. Um, on Earth right now, they mostly get excited because people get to think about whether or not they could be big ore deposit forming, forming sites. So the, the expert ex excitement there is much more from a, largely from an industrial kind of perspective. There's all the arcs and back arcs that are formed when you have subduction zones. Um, so around the, the backs of the subduction zones, we have all these shallow systems. The, the rocks there have been distilled out, so they tend to be more silicic than basalts. The disadvantage to them from, a, from an astrobiology perspective is that they tend to just make all the conditions more corrosive and more oxidizing, so they're less conducive to, um, less conducive to abiotic organic synthesis probably, although they can actually open up lots of interesting chemistries and different pressure and temperature conditions. So from, from a geochemistry and an oceanography perspective, they're great, but from an astrobiology perspective, um, people might be less excited about them. Uh, but the subduction zones themselves actually can go to very high pressures. And those are places, that's another place where you can get water exposed to ultramafic rocks. And so there's lots of potential for sepentinization systems to happen there. The trouble with that is a lot of that stuff happens at such high pressures, we haven't really had the technologies until recently to go that deep. Um, we have an ability to get down to about six and a half thousand meters. Those subduction zones go down to 11,000 meters. So there's a lot of a lot of pressure temperature space that's not available to us to go and study in the field. But that doesn't mean we can't do sort of theoretical modeling and actually predict whether it would be worthwhile of actually trying to pursue that. Uh, another place I've been thinking about a lot more recently are hotspot volcanoes. We can't require plate tectonics to happen on other planets, for example. But we have good evidence from both Mars and from Io, for example, for isolated volcanism. Um, on Mars, it's extinct. On Io, it's alive and well. And if you thought about whether or not that was the kind of thing that was happening on the seafloor of Enceladus, although the, the oceans of these other ocean worlds can be tremendously deep compared to Earth, because the planetary bodies are that much smaller, then gravity is weaker. And so the effective pressure at the seafloor can be quite different. On Europa, it's still quite challenging that that what's happening in the bottom of Earth's trenches might be the closest you can get to seafloor conditions on Europa. But for Enceladus, you probably don't need to go past a thousand meters deep. So things like the Loihi Seamount is somewhere that we've been studying 
of Hawaii as a, as a place where here's a, here's a water rock interaction happening just on a single volcano. Um, another place we haven't begun to study yet, uh, the other place that I think is, is important, are uh, transforms and fractures. Um, the Lost City site is a known place, but there are transforms and fractures all across the Pacific Ocean as well. And these things cut deep into the ocean crust. So there's no reason why the pathways there, there couldn't be pathways, maybe not spectacularly hot, but maybe you don't need to be, that are actually allowing water to access ultramafic rocks there. And so there's no reason why that couldn't be a, a much broader range of places on our planet where lost city type reactions could be happening, or again, other reactions above and outside of our current human experience. Um, so, and, and perversely, it's kind of weird that the first evidence that there might be fluid flow in a transform predates the first discovery of hydrothermal activity anywhere on the planet. So to come full circle, this paper by Bernati et al, was in EPSL, Earth and Planetary Science Letters in 1976. And at the time they just described this metalliferous deposit with concentric rings. If you go back today and look at it, it is transparently obvious that it was a dried up hydrothermal chimney. And it has the tree ring, if you break it open, it has the concentric mineral structure. So this was something that was in the middle of a fracture zone that's about a thousand kilometers long. So it was hundreds of kilometers from the nearest mid-ocean ridge and yet it was a hydrothermal chimney, but um, you know, it was found in the early 1970s before anybody had any context to know what it was they were looking at. And so it's an area that hasn't been returned to, uh, except that I have a cruise that I'm part of that just actually left San Diego on Monday this week, that's going out to the GOFAR transform and we're actually gonna be doing, I'm gonna be joining in vicariously via telepresence to actually look in the water column in their fracture zone it's a group of seismologists are going to actually go collect instruments, but we're going to be checking out and start trying to renew that because, again, it's it's a place where even on a fast spreading, volcanically active section of ridge, there could be ultramafic rocks getting access to seawater or seawater getting access to ultramafic rocks and, and cool stuff could be happening. And we don't know about it just because we haven't looked. Um, and then the last thing I'm just going to end with is is other kinds of flow. This is all stuff that's linked to when you can see volcanism and when you can see plate boundaries. But I think other things that we're thinking about right now is um, we've been doing some work from with the chemical oceanography program at NSF, geotraces. And one of the things we found recently was we went to do a study to see how far the chemical signatures from our hydrothermal system could be traced through the ocean. And we went to the Southern East Pacific rise where we knew that uh, a passive tracer, helium-3, which is a noble gas and completely inert, could be travel traced across the ocean. So we wanted to see if you could see things like iron and other biogeochemical active traces over a length scale of, say, 10 kilometers or 100 kilometers. And what we actually found was that the, we could still trace those other chemically reactive traces for 4,000 kilometers. It was like as far as our section went, we would stay for two months across the Pacific. By the time we got to Tahiti, we basically it was time to stop looking. And these other traces were still persisting out into the ocean. And we don't think they come from the high temperature venting. We can account for the stuff that comes from the high temperature venting, and that did go missing early on. But we think it may actually be that these lower temperature flows might have some ability to precondition material in and around the areas that are the most habitable, because the hot acid fluid is not the place where life wants to be anyway. But these lower temperature systems um, could actually be really important. We've done some preliminary work and think that they could be a lot more abundant than the high temperature vents anyway. And it's just because they're not readily detectable, we've been flying past them. So there's a, one new paper by Ed Baker that just came out in EPSL in 2016. And then I had a postdoc, Sheng Chen, we just published a second paper on the same topic uh, last year in deep sea research, which is showing up a thing that there's all these sections of mid-ocean ridge we've been looking at. There may be these lower temperature systems that can host biology and they may be three to five times more abundant than, than black smokers are along mid-ocean ridges. We just haven't been looking for them. So that's uh, putting my money where my mouth is. That's where my next research cruise is going to be. We're going to take an AUV out in bottom hugging mode to actually go and drive along that same section of the Southern East Pacific rise and see if we can find these things. There's lots of, lots of theoretical reasons and lots of you know, ser serendipitous data sets that suggest these things might be out there. Um, and they could be really important from a, from a life perspective, but we just have to go and actually work out how to detect them. Um, 
and then the last thing is the you know I need to make sure I don't I I'm trying to be more and more conscious of like leaving my prejudices behind when I go out into the ocean and think about what's out there. I used to think that only high temperature venting was important for chemical flux and everything else was just for physics. Um, you know, the volumes of heat and mass that get transported at lower temperatures, but there wouldn't be any import, impact on biogeochemistry. I don't believe that anymore, but I still have prejudices I have to overcome that out on the flanks of ridges, I still think that there's a whole bunch of low temperature, high volume flux that isn't, um, isn't playing a role in life. But again, I'm probably wrong about that as well. So I think I will stop there and see if anybody's still here. And open up for Chris, questions. Chris, thank you so much. What a wonderful overview. And I really enjoyed uh, you sharing 30 years worth of exploration experience and the, uh, the historical tidbits, particularly the 1976 find is just really, really interesting. Um, so the floor is open for questions. If any of you have any questions for Dr. German, just turn on your camera and uh, please ask. Hello, uh, Chris. Hey, Tom, go Can I ask for a it. question? Yeah, uh, so based on your copious experience in visiting all these different types of venting on the earth, uh, what would be at this point your best guess of which of those systems is gonna come closest to what you think would be at the bottom of the oceans of Europa and Enceladus? Um, I think there's two answers to that, right? There's a, what do I think and what do I want to be true? Um, so anything that has a potential for some form of serpentinization and is chemically reducing provides the best opportunities for having kind of abiotic organic synthesis, which if you wanna have an, an origin for life that you wanna go look for, that might be really important. Um, the the kind of what I what I'm finding things you know, when I when I started getting involved in astrobiology what I found frustrating was there was so little constraint on what the rocky interior might actually be at the seafloor that that when you have gravity and libration and that's about it you can you can um, if you have electromagnetic induction too great then you can say okay well then there's a water density layer on the outside and we can have some idea of how much of that is solid and how much of it is liquid. And then you can have a rocky interior and you can work out what its average density is, but there's no, Occam's razor doesn't allow you to differentiate whether something is, sorry, doesn't allow you to distinguish whether the rocky interior is differentiated or not. And so that becomes a really big open question, I think, of um, you know, what's the rock type that the seawater might be interacting with? And one of the things that's, I think, really interesting is you know, the original spectra from Europa, for example, um, could detect molecular bands, right? The infrared could, could detect that there was sulfate present. And so people could go, oh, well then that's either sulfuric acid or it's magnesium sulfate. And so then that tells you it's a chondritic kind of interior with a very you know, ultramafic kind of composition. But then the thing is that the, the methods that you were using to search couldn't have detected sodium chloride there anyway. So it's been, it's been kind of in, interesting to see the new work that's come out um, from things like um, Suzanne Trumbo's paper two years ago in Science Advances says, oh, well, then if there's sodium chloride, then maybe there's been more differentiation of the rocky interior and you've got a more silicic seafloor. Um, so I think it's, that's, that's really, it's out of that frustration is where our project came from of like, well, let's, let's make all the predictions we can of what could be happening because computer modeling is cheap. You know, space missions are really expensive, but field work in the, in the deep ocean is expensive too. Um, so computer models are the cheapest thing we can imagine, and you can do multiple you know, forward runs of those and then work out what tiny subset of that parameter space looks like the kind of stuff that would be exciting for habitability and life. Um, sorry, that's a long and vague answer, Tom, that probably went in the wrong direction. But I think, I think that's where I'm getting at is, <laughs> I don't know. And what I'm trying to think about is, well, what would I want to measure in the future to try and help answer that question that you asked of? What's happening at the seafloor, and which ones, which which seafloor is the best seafloor?
Go ahead, Barbara. I see you have your a question to ask. Thanks. I'm feeding right into that. Uh, thank you so much for this, Chris. That was just um, one of the best lectures I've heard all year, just because of the, <laughs> the open-mindedness, the insight, the context. Uh, thank you so much. Um, one of the, and I really loved your emphasis on the open-mindedness and the, the history of why open-mindedness is so important to what we're doing. So my specific question is about our open-mindedness around some of the various processes of water-rock reaction that can actually mm -hmm. produce hydrogen and some of these other products, particularly abiotic organic synthesis. We know why we all are so interested in mafic and ultramafic rock, but uh, recently we've just published a paper from Kid Creek working with Verena Hauer and Kai Heinrichs, where we've been looking mm -hmm. at the very large concentrations of acetate and formate in those ancient, ancient waters. And it turns out that it appears to be produced by abiotic organic synthesis. And in this case, we may see, in fact, a linkage related to radiolysis. The thing about radiolysis is this is something that takes place regardless of the rock type. And so in that sense, it's, I think, a very important set of water rock reactions to take a look at because it frees up the constraint space. We're no longer then right. either on the ocean floor or when we go to other planets. We're no longer constrained to saying, well, it's got to be ultramafics or it's got to be this poor pH range or it's got to. So from the point of view of opening up our sense of just how habitable a planet might be, it's, a, I think, a real game changer to really take a serious look at these radiolytically driven reactions and particularly some of the recent evidence we've got that it's related to not just radiolysis driving hydrogen production and not just radiolysis driving a deep sulfur cycle but also potentially radiolysis contributing to an abiotic carbon cycle and therefore to habitability. And is this getting powered by potassium, uranium, and thorium decay? Yes, exactly. Can you do a yeah. radiolysis? Right. Yeah, which is why it's a, a universal, right? Yeah. Independent so of something... and less constrained by pH and things. It was funny. It was the, um, the first ocean worlds meeting I ever went to. It was just pure happenstance that, you know, I, I sat, went into a room full of 50 strangers and the person I sat down next to was Christoph Sotan. Yes. Who was like a guy, and I just read his chapter in the Europa book um, about how all the tidal heating on, you know, so I'd, I'd read the Sunday supplement, you know, I got into this stuff through, you know, the likes of a John Delaney saying, oh, well, you know, if Io can be volcanic, why couldn't the seafloor of Europa be volcanic too because of the same tidal heating processes? And then I'd read Christoph's paper that said, but the ocean on Europa could actually just work like a giant shock absorber. And maybe all the tidal motion is accommodated in the ocean, in which case the rocks are just boring and dead. And and so that's that's actually what got me thinking about you know the transform forts on Earth and fracture zones was well, but even on a planet that's frozen solid like Earth's moon, there would still be potassium, uranium, thorium decay happening. And over some time scale, you would still expect there to be some kind of thermal contraction and fracturing and if you do that underneath an overlying ocean overburden you can't really stop the water getting in so that became a thing i ended up talking to andy fisher about um, at uc santa cruz who's really interested in hydrogeology and, and that was a question i put to him of if you took the moon which has some inherent topography today and you put an ocean on top of it could you stop water from flowing and he said no it's inevitable you know you would have a pressure differential between the high ground and the low ground and water would start flowing through that rock. So until that point when the entire planetary system reaches equilibrium, you would get chemical reactions coming out of that. And Norm Sleep has modeled these mm -hmm. as well in terms of propagation of fracture just based on uh, normal stress, non-plate tectonic stress in intra-plate fracturing on long time right. scales. And all of these are actual processes that drive a hydrogeologic cycle very different from our classic picture of the hydrogeologic cycle. Right, but I think the the, the neat thing is, uh, Occam's razor says there there isn't a bad ocean world from that mm -hmm. perspective, right? They mm -hmm. should all be active, they should all have some kind of circulation happening. They all have they all have their own potential and then it's trying to work out, okay, then what's what's the relative potential of each of them in terms of the energy yield that could be coming out of them? And then really the second part is, and um, where might that manifest itself, which I think maybe is getting back further, closer into the network for life detection is, okay, then which ones are the ones that you can actually, you know, which are the ones that are most amenable to go and explore and come up with that definitive, definitive evidence. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Without necessarily restricting ourselves just to the idea that we need both mafic and ultra mafic. Right. Great discussion. Thank you, Barbara, for your question. Anybody else have any questions? Well, if not, um, Chris, thank you so much again for taking the time to uh, guide us through this uh, tour of events. Really fascinating presentation. And uh, if any of you uh, would like to give a talk again uh, at this uh, seminar series, please, please, please let us know at contact.enfold at gmail.com. We're all excited about building a network around life detection and life detection technologies. So if you're more on the science side or more on the engineering side, all this is very interesting to us. Um, so with that, uh, have a great uh, rest of your day and uh, look up for an email for the next seminar. And thank you for the invitation, Sanjoy. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here. Bye.